So humans have modified the nature of the plant and the nurture of the plant to make it amenable for farming. And this has been a continuous process. So what's the nature of the plant? It is the inherent ability of the plant to be what it is. For example, if you look at this tree here, the tree inherently is able to grow to a height of, say, 70 or 80 feet. And that's coded in its genes. It's the genetic makeup which determines the nature of an organism. Now, it may have the potential to grow to 70 or 80 feet, but what determines whether it actually grows to that height is the nurture or the external environment which it faces. Farming has involved the continuous modification of both the nature and nurture. Nurture would involve many, many aspects. It would involve replenishing the nutrients which the plants, when they grow, they suck out of the soil. See, in wild environments, you should realize, or in natural environments, say like a forest, the plants, when they grow, they have to take in, along with the water, the different nutrients that they require to assimilate into their tissues. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, these are major nutrients. Now, in natural environments, which I was referring to, you don't take away anything from that place. So when the plant dies, the whole thing gets recycled into that environment. But when you do farming, what actually happens is a portion of those nutrients are removed from that location because you're actually taking it away as the produce. So how do you replenish it? Now that's a key. In fact, in this context, I think early days, people used to use farmyard manure. So, Synthetic fertilizers, the discovery of synthetic fertilizers to provide at least some of these major nutrients has made a huge impact in the progress of farming over the years. So this is actually what it shows here, is actually the nitrogen balance map. So the red areas are where the nitrogen that is removed from the soil is more than what actually is going back. That means the soil is getting sicker and sicker. The light green areas are the ideal ones where there is a balance between the removal due to crop cultivation and where there's an input. But I want you to focus on the statement, nearly half the people on this planet wouldn't be here if the productivity levels have not been increased to the levels that we have today. Genetic modification of plants has happened through deliberate human intervention from the time settled agriculture started. Now, in the initial days, probably people didn't know what they were doing. It was an intuitive act. The farmer, usually the women, they were, they were first engaged in farming because the men would go hunting. The women were the ones who had the time to look after their children and also grow the plant they would select the plant which yields the most out of the variation that is available in nature and save those seeds to be planted the next season, while as the rest of the harvest they would consume. So what is inadvertently happening is they are accumulating the useful or the desirable genes into plants to derive varieties. This was the original. I think about 4,000 years ago, corn originated in South America. So Zia maize, Parvi glumis, it still exists. That's the progenitor of corn. The Incans and the Mayans, through this process of selection from natural variation, they derived this, which looks more or less similar to what we get today, the butta that you eat. Now, a lot of analysis have been done using some of the modern tools. You can refer to the paper that is listed here. In this process, Literally thousands of genes of corn has been modified, either in their structure or in their expression. And we talk about genetic modification. That's why I said genetic modification has been a part and parcel of domestication of plants. Like I said before, the farmers who did this improvement probably didn't know what was happening. They knew the result, the outcome was evident 
But why that outcome was happening was not evident till the mid 19th century. When this man pictured here, he is an Austrian monk. He lived in the 1800s. Gregor Mendel, Johann Mendel, who did some experiments in his free time on these garden peas. See, from the time of Aristotle, I think when we have written history, people have been concerned about how traits are inherited. In other words, this phenomenon is called heredity. And they also were concerned about how is it that traits are inherited, but we still have variation. The children of same set of parents will have variations among them, but there will be many traits which are common. So heredity and variation. The study of heredity and variation is the science of genetics. So Mendel, after careful observation of his experiments using garden pea, propounded the basic principles of genetics. Now I'm not going into more of that, but suffice it to say, the major difference of his hypothesis to compare to what was known previously, even Darwin attended some, uh, you know, attempted some explanation for this phenomenon, was that each trait is controlled by what he called at that time factors, discrete factors within the cell. And during inheritance, or even when they are brought together, these factors remain discrete. They don't blend with each other. And when the next generations, you have further generations going, the factors can segregate out and they can recombine in new combinations. So this was a powerful idea. Now since that time, crop improvement became a deliberate activity because you, should you could choose parents which had different traits. You could combine them in the appropriate combinations and create variation through segregation. Let me try to illustrate it with an example of some flowers because Bangalore is supposed to be a garden city. I said supposed to be a garden city. So these are carnations. Now on the left, <coughs> you have a carnation which has a long stalk and a red flower. You know, long stalk, let's assume that it's not a great trait for putting it in a vase. You know, it can bend down, it can lodge. But on the right side, you have a carnation which has a white flower, not a very attractive flower color, but a short stalk. As far as putting it in a vase or keeping it somewhere, it's a good trait. So how do you, if I have to improve this carnation, make a new type, which is red flower and short stalk, I cross these two, and in the segregating generations, I do get the parental types, but I also get a new set of variants, and I actually can select the short stalk red flowered carnation. That is how most of these varieties which were developed to ward off the predicted hunger and famine, which Malthus had predicted for the high-yielding high yielding varieties, which ushered in the Green Revolution were produced. They introduced a dwarfing gene, made the plants dwarf, so that the plant could accumulate more biomass without lodging. And more of that biomass went into the seed. The harvest intake increased. But the problem is, such improvement is limited by reproductive isolation. So you can't cross, suppose you didn't have a red flowered carnation, you can't cross the white flowered carnation with a rose. So this is where the power of some of the new tools that biology has to offer. This is the introduction of foreign genes, genes from other organisms, even though they are reproductively non-compatible, happens and this is why there is some amount of controversy about these. Today when we talk about GMOs, we refer to those crops which are improved using these methods. Now it's not done. We are not playing God. Actually, what is happening is we are observing what is there in nature and then fine-tuning it to put it to our use. See, this is the crown gall disease. It is common in the northern hemispheres. And more than 100 years ago, it was discovered that this disease is caused by a bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. Now, Agrobacterium tumefaciens insects, infects plants. And in the last 50 years or 70 years of research, it has come to be known it actually transfers a piece of its DNA to the plant. And that piece of DNA essentially makes the plant machinery gets integrated with the plant's uh, genes, and it starts making certain hormones, which results in the tumor formation. Now, these genes, 
which is transferred from the agrobacterium also produces certain compounds called opines, which are food for the bacterium. So the bacterium essentially creates an environment for itself where it can thrive, grow, and multiply. It doesn't kill the plant, but debilitates it because much of the energy is now mobilized into these tumors, which is not really useful for the plant. So in the new techniques that we use to transfer foreign genes, we leverage this mechanism. We cut out the tumor-inducing genes from the agrobacterium, from the tDNA, introduce the region of your interest, your gene of your interest, and what we essentially do is trick the agrobacterium to transfer the gene of your interest into the host plant which you want to be transformed. Now these are cartoons, but I am actually showing some actual pictures of how cotton transformation happens. This is cotton plant, and we do it routinely. We also work on rice and several other crop species. The, if I want to point one specific difference between some of the earlier tools and the modern tools, when you cross and then create this variation, it is quite possible that in addition to the gene that you want to transfer, which is represented as a red dot here, you get some additional regions also transferred. But in the new techniques, since you can use these molecular tools to precisely excise out just the region that you want to transfer, you can say that with the new tools, plant breeding or crop improvement has become much more precise. Many examples of crop improvement in India, we are all familiar with cotton and Bt cotton. So what is Bt cotton? Bt cotton is a cotton plant made resistant to the notorious bollworm pe pest by introducing a gene from a bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis. Again, this bacterium was discovered almost 110 years ago, first by the Japanese, but then described more in detail by the German Mr. Berliner, Dr. Berliner, and so the name Bacillus means rod shape. Thuringiensis is after the German province of Thuringia. So this produces a pro it's actually a natural pathogen of the Lepidopteran insects. So we now express that gene in the cotton plant in tiny amounts. You are talking about microgram levels of the protein being expressed, and when the insect eats that cotton, I think it succumbs to it. And what has been the impact? Cotton production, this is the only GM crop that is allowed in this country. Cotton production in India was 14 million bales before the introduction of BT cotton. Now it is close to 40 million bales from 2002 to 2014. Now I can say many more things. India was a net importer of cotton. Now it's a net exporter of cotton. It is the second largest producer of cotton. I can go on and on. We also work on rice. We have our own versions of BT cotton, by the way, which is uh, commercially approved. We also work on rice. And here it's a different technique. You make the rice plant express a sequence which, when it comes in contact with a notorious fungal pathogen, which causes a disease called blast, Magnaporta oryce, it triggers a reaction which is there in all higher organisms that is sometimes referred to as RNAi or RNA interference. So you're not expressing a protein, but you are expressing an RNA which triggers RNAi reaction. You can actually see the screening trials. These are under containment. We still have, don't have permissions to actually put them out. So when the pathogen infects, you can see the ones which carry the gene that we have introduced are still standing, whereas the ones that don't have the control, they all succumb to the disease. So there is a potential here. And huge amount of fungicide is used in rice to control this pathogen. And in spite of that, there is a huge amount of loss happening in this country. Why do we need all these tools? You know, there are some people who argue that you don't need them, we have enough food. You all know that we need to produce more food. The demand is growing up. But I want to look at it in a different way, particularly because I live in India. 55% of all the working people in this country work on agriculture. Now, agriculture is probably the largest private enterprise in this country. Their contribution to the GDP is a mere 13 to 14%. That means the amount of GDP contribution per capita for somebody engaged in agriculture is significantly lower 
then somebody engaged in the other fields. Improvement of agriculture, making it more profitable, is the way for equitable growth. We want our country to grow. We want our country GDP to grow, and it should be equitable. Well, additional challenges due to climate change. You see the water tables are going down, so you need to make the plants more efficient in terms of utilizing water. Arable land is not increasing. It's been about 126 million hectares for many, many years. This is 2001. If you take the data now, it would have probably dipped. Technology can actually play a significant role in improving productivity. This is the data. You can see the food grain production where such technology has not been infused continues to be growing at about 1.2% on an average. Our population is growing at 1.8%, mind you. Except cotton, since the introduction in 2002, it has actually gone up to almost 4%. The scientific consensus on GM crop safety is probably as solid as the consensus on the theory of gravitation. So if you look at the consensus, all the major scientific academies have said that the GM crops, if not they are safer, they are as safe as foods produced through any other means. I will just, this is the penultimate slide. I just want to show you one of the longest running experiments in agriculture in the world. This is at the Rothamsted Agricultural Experimental Station in the UK. This is a fertilizer and variety experiment. This is with wheat. Has been running, I think, much before, started much before Mendel published his paper. It has been continuously running even now. We talked about nurture and nature. How this has helped to, you can, it is evident from the result, how it has helped to improve the productivity and production of crops. If there has been no fertilizer application, the yield levels of wheat, in spite of the genetic improvements, would have removed here, remained here. But with judicious fertilizer applications, you can see the details, I can share the slide with you. You have today reached a yield levels of up to 10 tons from one ton per hectare. But what is important, to keep in mind, this is my last slide. While doing all this, today we need to make sure that we are also conscious about how this will impact the environment or nature. Agriculture is a man-driven, man-made activity. It is as artificial or as man-made as everything that you see around here. Whether it's the genetic modification of crops, whether it is modification of the nurture, it is a man-made activity. There are some advocates who suggest that you do natural farming, by which they mean you don't look at any of the new technologies that you use. How can farming be natural? Farming is man-made. In my view, natural farming is an oxymoron. But you can make agriculture nature friendly. You can make sure that you don't destroy the habitat of these lovely animals like these regal sunbird in Rwanda, actually. Without destroying the habitat, how do you make agriculture nature friendly? You can use less chemical pesticides if you include technologies like some of the BT crops, because they require, it are, you are essentially increasing or improving the nature of the plant to resist the pests. You can judiciously use fertilizers, inorganic fertilizers and farmyard manure to make sure that in addition to adding the nutrient, you are also improving the other properties of the soil. So that is what I would like to recommend. A new paradigm. When we talk about organic agriculture in this context, when you have to feed the billions that will be added to this world population, you have to think about a new paradigm of agriculture. You can call it organic or natural, whatever you want, which judiciously mixes these different technologies. You cannot afford to ignore some of these new tools that we have today in addressing some of the problems we have. Thank you very much.